platicar el día de hoy con Robert Smith de The Cure. Robert, first of all, thank you very much for the time of this interview. That's all right. So, uh, this album, talking about the creating process of the album, what is the biggest difference between this album and the other one of The Cure? Um, the most obvious difference is the, um, the fact that we played this live in the studio, which sounds strange, but... Um, At live? Yeah, well, I actually sang as we were playing, which oh. normally I don't. Normally we record in layers and we develop yeah. the songs and then we change them and I chop them up and we... It, usually the process of making the record happens whilst, it sounds weird, this, whilst we're in the studio. We go in with a kind of an idea of what we want to do and then we work it out as we record. With this one, because we had Ross Robinson producing, yeah. he took care of all that before we went in the studio. We spent a month playing and playing and playing and playing. So when we went in the studio, we actually just spent each day, we set up and we recorded. So it's essentially, it's a live album. And, and I mean, you've been in a lot of times in a record studio. Uh, what could it be like one of the best memories that you have uh, during the time that you were doing an album? Well, I actually had more fun making this record than any other record I've made. Why? Um, because it was so intense all the time. I really loved it. Ross works as hard as I do, and he is as intense as, as I can be. He's enthusiastic and totally involved in the process. Yeah. So it was really nice for me to have someone who's there all the time, because normally the band isn't there all the time. They kind of they do their bit and then they disappear. So. Um, Most of the time, I feel kind of quite lonely when I'm, I'm making albums, yeah. which is a good thing, I suppose. Uh, when I'm singing, it kind of it helps me to. And sometimes you need that loneliness to create yeah. uh, better music. Yeah, I, I mean, there are um, thousands of um, times in the studio when I've thought this is so good. I mean, really, every time that you finish a song is a really great feeling. You know, every time you finish a mix of a song, it's like. You've made something from nothing. It's like the, the reason why I still do it, that feeling. Yeah, and, and talking about uh, memories of uh, yourself, you have two older brothers, right? Oh, an older brother, one older brother. One older brother. Yeah. What is the most important thing that you learn from him? Uh, to <laughs> love books, actually. Really? Yeah. When I was young, he used to read to me all the time. What is your favorite book? My favorite book of all time. Uh, it's hard, I know. It's very hard. <laughs> I mean, I suppose just because a, a book that still holds a place in my heart is um, the Gorman Gars trilogy by Mervyn Peake, which is a, just a, a kind of like a fantasy wow. set of fantasy stories, but um, only because it, it kind of reminds me of a certain time in my childhood. I've read far better books, yeah. you know. Than, I mean, it, I can't, <laughs> honestly, I couldn't tell you what my favorite book is. There's no, there is no such thing. I like too many different books. And do you have any like younger brother or sister? No? I've got a, yeah, an older sister and I've got one younger sister. And what is the hardest thing for you to be in the middle of your family? Um, I'm not really in the middle because my older brother and sister are 12 and 15 years older oh, because okay. my mum wasn't supposed to have any more children and then yeah. suddenly I came along. So <laughs> me and my little sister are kind of We were always together, and my older brother and sister were together. Oh, so it's more like okay. two teams yeah. rather than being in the middle. Yeah. And and uh, talking about that time, did you like like comics or superheroes at that time? Yeah, and I still do. In fact, I spent all day yesterday reading comics. What is like your favorite comic or your favorite superhero? Um, <laughs> Deathlock, the Demolisher. The Demolisher. <laughs> cool, cool. That's great. And do you have? Uh, oh, did you have at that time like any pets? In your house? Um, yeah, I grew up with it. We always had pets in our house. I haven't got any now, though. Really? We always used to have, like, cats and dogs and rabbits and hamsters and Oh, wow, well, like a and, zoo. Yeah. And, yeah. and at that time, you also started... <laughs> and then they always used to die, and I was like... <laughs> <laughs> so, like they do. And, and at that time, you also started admiring uh, great artists, such as Jimi Hendrix. Mm. What is, like, the most important thing that you admire of him? Well, when I was... Um, I and mean, that's in the 60s, I was like between, I discovered him through my older brother, he used to play him, mm -hmm. and I, I was kind of probably seven years old when I first became aware of who Jimi Hendrix was, in that's like 1967, 1968. Yeah. He just represented, I suddenly realized that there was a big colorful world out there, uh -huh. because at that age, everything's to do with kind of just school and home, you mm -hmm. don't really do very much at the age of like seven, eight, nine, you have no independence, you, haven't, you really have no power. I mean, you don't for a long time, you know, you come closer to your 18 or really until that happens. But um, I, I began to dawn on me that, that this, this weird bloke 
played guitar and sang as a job. Yeah. You know? And I, 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 it just stuck with me. And so all the way through school, I always used to think, people say, what do you want to be? And I'd, think, I'd say something, you know, like, I'll be a gardener or all. <laughs> in my head, I think, I'll be Jimi Hendrix. And <laughs> yeah. And, and, well, you're doing a great job, yeah. I mean. <laughs> Jimi and, Hendrix impersonator, yeah. And, and um, uh, after, you've been involved in music, like, for three decades. What is, like, um, the the biggest mistake that you think that music industry is still doing right now? Um, oh, there's so many. <laughs> I, think, I, think this, I think the stupidest thing that they're doing actually is um, is the amount that they're forcing. Um, just as an example, like the the amount that they're forcing people to pay for downloads yeah. is too much. Like that, they all just got together and, and forced um, Apple to increase the price of downloads on iTunes yeah. and in fact they should be reducing it it should become like five cents a song yeah. um, and all the money should go to the artist <laughs> <laughs> I mean they, they're kind of they don't really they haven't really quite grasped and there's been this ongoing struggle for the last five years because the means of distribution as in any industry is yeah. the key and the majors have been struggling to kind of contain and constrain how music's like distributed on the internet And they've come up with such half-baked ideas, and none of them have really worked. And yeah. the, the fact that they're charging... I mean, if you buy it now, at the moment, the way that current rates are, if you buy this our, our album on iTunes, track by track, you'll actually end up paying almost as much as if you went and bought the CD. The CD yeah. I yeah. mean, it it's okay. doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. So that's just one very obvious big mistake that they're making. Because, um, And as an artist, it hurts, because they're forcing people to download music illegally still. Yeah. Because no one's going to pay, like... You know, 50 cents for a song. I mean, why should you? Yeah, it yeah. exists as digital information. It's like it doesn't cost anyone anything. You know, it's like. So anyway, that's one thing. The 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 other mistake is that, which hurts a lot of younger artists. It doesn't really impact on us as much. Um, is the ludicrous amount of money that they spend on things like Pop Idol and all that yeah. sort of shit. It's like, it's all the money that they generate from other bands goes into these ridiculous competitions to find one band that will sell like a million albums for like one month. And then no one hears about it, you know. And it's that, it's this kind of constant, everything's speeded up to the point where everything has to happen now, everything has to sell now. And there's almost like a disregard for like cultivating artists who will like, you know, make music in the future. Yeah. So. And in, in a lot of uh, the songs of The Cure, uh, you talk in a certain way about, about love. What is like your own definition about love? Um, I suppose the, for me it's the inability to to kind of comprehend a life without the person that I love. Yeah. I couldn't imagine it. I think, that I, I mean, it's that sense that you would honestly feel like you would die if that person wasn't there. And, and of course, one of the most important person in your life about that is Mary, your wife. Mm. What, is, what do you think that is the best of her? Um, that she puts up with me. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And, well, well, that's true, yeah, of course. And, Some other people have told me that they listen to the Cure songs when they're sad because they feel that somebody understands them. But what about you? What, what did you do when you're sad uh, and try to forget for a little while your problems? Um, well, I mean, all through the years there have been various artists. One artist that I always refer back to, um, even when I'm making a record, as, as the epitome of all that I think is good about songwriting and singing is Nick Drake. Yeah. I've always really loved what he does because it's very, very emotional, it's very heartfelt. And there's, there's lots of artists down the years that I can connect with. I mean, mainly it's like with vocalists, so you can feel a singing from the heart, and you just like, you want to just lose yourself in that music. But it's also, strange enough, my favourite music for the last few years to listen to when I'm feeling a bit down is, um, is Mogwai, and they don't really have any vocals. That is in the Curiosa Festival. Right? Yeah, and I think the reason is because it, I mean, it's the most beautiful music I've ever heard, and there's no words, so I actually sing... So I just sing to myself when I'm listening to it. So it's, um, I find it very therapeutic, actually. I, they're uh, the best band on the planet. Cool. And I was uh, reading the lyric of one of your songs, Us or Them, and the first thing that I, that I think is like, wow, this, this song is like really dedicated to Tony Blair. Is mm. that right or no? Um, it's not exclusively Tony Blair. It's more, it's, it's really aimed at Western media and their portrayal of everything as being black and white and it's simplification and the dumbing down of culture and it's taken like um, I just feel in the last few years that 
it's almost like the tapes running backwards. We're all being kind of like taken back to the womb, and everyone you talk to out of the television set, as you know, I feel like I'm five years old. They're saying, like, <laughs> you know, you know, these are the bad guys, and these are the good guys. And it's like, and the world isn't like that. So um, I, it's very unusual for The Cure to do a, any kind of political song because I like our music to be timeless and escapist, and I don't really like to put it in the now. But um, I got so angry, and have been so, you know, I'm getting angrier about it as the months go by. The way that, um, I mean, taking Tony Blair as an example, just because he happens to lead the country that I, that I live in, yeah. um, it's the, the idiocy of like someone who has the trust, I mean, one of the very few leaders in the Western world who actually has had the trust of a big percentage of the population, and completely abuses that trust by... Yeah. Following North America's lead, you know, and and not just the fact that he makes that decision, but lies to everyone about why he's making the decision, and that's it. And then expects everyone to forget that he's abused that trust, and just like and say, well, yeah, right, but trust me now, you know. Yeah. And you can't do that. It's like with integrity. Once you lose it, once you sell out, you can't decide that you want to get it back. And it's the same with trust. If you if someone trusts you and you abuse that trust, that's it. You can't. You're an, an untrustworthy person. So, all those factors. I think it's just. It's a shame because I f even I felt that, that four years ago that we might have a leader that would actually do socially do some good in our country because I thought he had some good ideas. But it's like you're constantly let down by people, you know. It's, um, unfortunately, it seems to be it's human nature. It's, it's <laughs> and for you, what is the biggest challenge of being the lead singer of The Cure? Staying sane. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Um, well. Because when I do this, it's the, it's the gaps between us doing this are quite long, and I forget sometimes how um, disturbed it makes me feel. You know, the constant attention doing things like this, doing the press conference and stuff. It's just, <laughs> I mean, I, it, it, I've, you know, I, I don't really feel comfortable doing it. I suppose yeah. I like singing, but the rest of it I can kind of do without most of the time. Now you know how to play guitar, bass, keyboards, even drums. Is there any any other instrument that would you like to to learn how to play it? Yeah, I've had a cello in my house for more than ten years. Really? With a book on it, it says "Learn how to play cello," <laughs> and uh, I still haven't got past page three. <laughs> if if you were not a musician, what other what other thing would you like to would you like it to be? Uh, I would. Uh, nothing really. No. That's the weird thing, because I, I mean, yeah. whatever else I was, even if I was a writer, if I could decide I'd want to be something else, you know, if I had the ability to do something else and enjoy it, I would still pick up a guitar and play. So I'd still end up being a musician, because you know, yeah. that's what the thing yeah. I enjoy most is making music. So um, it's weird, really. I mean, I'd like to be an astronomer, actually. Oh, I'd, really? I'd like to have a huge, uh, like, a seriously big telescope at my disposal. Do you like the universe and the stars? I'd, I've, been, I've had a telescope for about. 15 years now. It's like my one hobby is, um, is astronomy. But, I, you know, if I was an astronomer, I'd probably like nothing. I really wish I was a guitarist. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And, and another question. Uh, if you could choose, or, or if you could go back in time and see yourself during the time of Three Imaginary Boys, what advice did you tell to yourself? Um, there's nothing actually major that I would do differently. I, th I think that... Um, I've been, I mean, I've, I've always followed my instincts. Every decision that I've made with regards to, like, the, the band and what I do with the band has been how I feel, is, like, what I feel should be right. So I've never t really taken anyone's advice about anything. So the mistakes that I've made have been my mistakes. I, I mean, I would probably make them again, even if I went back and I said, look, don't do this. I'd say, what do you know? You know <laughs> um, I probably would, there's, I would got rid of Fiction Records five years earlier. That's the only thing I would do differently, but the rest, <laughs> the rest of it is, you know, it's been good. Okay, last question. I don't know if it's even a valid question, but did you watch uh, the movie Nightmare Before Christmas of Tim Burton? Yeah. What do you think about it? I think it's a very excellent film. Yeah. I really think that if Jack was a really uh, normal uh, person, he would be like a big The Cure fan. Do you think? It yeah. reminds me of Billy Corgan, actually. Billy Corgan? Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, in some ways. But Billy's a big Cure fan. So he's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Billy's a big Cure fan. Yeah. So do you like that movie? I think it's, yeah, it's excellent. It's really excellent. I, I would like to have um, made a video like that, actually, right. with that kind of style, which is sort of like very dark animated stuff. But um, it's very time-consuming and um, very unlikely that we would do it. I'd love to, to um, write music for a film like that. Right. That would be my one ambition, would be to write the entire score 
for a film that's favorite as good director? as that. Um, I don't know. I've got a favourite director actually. I mean, because I like different people for different reasons. Yeah. I like, I like up until recently, I like the Coen Brothers. I've always liked Tim Burton. He's good. David Lynch is kind of oh, an interesting director. Great. So there's a number of you know Pedro Almodovar is a really good director. There's like there's some seriously good directors around. Um, I, w I would like to at some point collaborate with someone, not of that stature, but just someone made a much you know probably on their first film and just make a film soundtrack. That's the one of the few ambitions that I have left. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time in this interview. Anything you, can you say to all of your fans that watch you in Monterrey or that is going to watch you here in Mexico City? Uh, enjoy it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for everything. Okay. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much.